to uh, the second of our Environmental Humanities uh, public lectures for this, uh, for this year, uh, this academic year. Um, by happy coincidence, both uh, Glenn Albrecht and Vic McEwen uh, were in Bark now. Uh, and uh, they have both emailed me independently to say, could I give a talk? Um, and I thought that there's a real sort of synergy between the rather different kinds of work that they do um, and that it would be a really interesting experiment to actually have them both talk together. So um, they're each going to give a, a talk and we're going to open it up for, um, for discussion and I shall introduce them separately, uh, beginning with Professor Glenn Albrecht. Um, who has been, had been for many years a uh, professor of sustainability at Murdoch University um, in Western Australia, um, which I think we could say has been a real, a real centre for sustainability research actually in Australia. Um, and uh, since, um, since retiring from, from Murdoch, um, he has had a position um, at the University of Newcastle in Environmental Studies, and he's currently honorary fellow in the School of Geosciences um, at the University of Sydney. And uh, uh, many people know of Glenn's uh, concept of solastalgia. Um, this was uh, part of his pioneering work, looking at the, 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 the mental, the health and psychological dimensions of environmental trauma, the experience of traumatic environmental change. Um, and, um, and I can't miss this opportunity to say with some pride that the concept of soul nostalgia was actually launched in the pages of a journal that I was co-editing, Philosophy, <coughs> Access and Nature, in 2005. And the article was, Soul Nostalgia, a new concept in um, health and identity, Pan 3, 2005. And since then, Glenn has gone on to elaborate that concept in various ways and to develop new concepts, um, of which my, my favourite at the moment is a symbiosis. I think he's going to talk a bit about that today as well. So, um, as well as being um, a philosopher, uh, Glenn describes himself um, as a farm officer, farm officer um, on a Wallaby Farm in the Hunter region of New South Wales. Um, and uh, the farming, however, is not keeping him from his uh, computer, from uh, his work um, of a more intellectual kind. And he has a new book <coughs> coming out called Earth Emotions, New Words for a New World with Cornell University Press, which is out next year. So I'm really thrilled, Glenn, that you're able to be with us here tonight. Over to you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I, I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to speak to an audience of environmental humanities and other transdisciplinary type people who are intrigued by the words like psychotoratic and solastalgia. And uh, I have to say it was a, a, a wonderful thing that Pan agreed to publish my essay on solastalgia because I didn't know what to do with it, I just had this idea. And there were very few transdisciplinary uh, journals around that would even consider publishing such a thing. So it's had a long life now, it's almost 15 years, and it's still being uh, extensively used and discovered by people, so I'm really pleased. Now, uh, I'll try to sort of sneak in around here, <laughs> pop out the other just, side just, again. Well, Glenn's just getting his uh, thing up. Um, it, it was actually um, referred to in The Guardian um, a couple of weeks ago, um, um. Uh, and <coughs> by Robert McFarlane. Um, uh, so nostalgia has hit the press in the UK just in recent weeks. Yeah, and uh, internationally it's uh, doing really well, which is unfortunate because every time it's been published or re referred to, it means that something's going wrong in the world. So right. uh, I would much rather uh, nostalgia be taken out of the E uh, dictionary um, by the time I'm dead, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. <laughs> All right, so here we go. So, uh, the psychotheoretic. Uh, Psyche-Earth Relationships, uh, that's my specialty, and uh, solastalgia is one example of a psychotoratic uh, mental uh, state. Uh, I prefer to call it an emotion or, um, or a psychological state. 
I'm looking at fire and smoke because the Swedish Agricultural Sciences University invited me to go and tour the fire ravaged landscapes of Sweden with them to try to get to help them understand the impact of wildfire on this, the Swedish people. Uh, they've uh, hardly ever had a, a history of wildfire in the past and so uh, philosopher goes to Sweden and my it's a new kind of tourism, psychoterratic tourism. <laughs> Some people call it disaster tourism, but there can be good aspects of the psychoterratic, as you'll see. Now, uh, <coughs> so, fire. I'm, being an Australian, I obviously come from a land of fire, and the fire story in Australia goes back 65 to 80,000 years. So it's a really good case study in how humans can interact with uh, fire prone or uh, at risk of fire landscapes. And so the Aboriginal people of Australia across, you know, 500 odd bioregions with their 500 odd languages had to deal with fire in so many different types of landscapes. And so they perfected the art of managing fire. And I'll just briefly touch on that because I don't have a huge amount of time. But I had the pleasure of working in Arnhem Land on a project which was the ethics of killing and hunting buffalo by indigenous people. So I'm an applied ethicist. And so I often like to get out of the office and do things. Well, you can't sort of get out of the office in a more spectacular way than uh, by going to Arnhem Land. Cyrus, uh, one of the uh, young men who were the traditional owners of this outstation called Kolobadada, uh, they practice this mosaic burning technique which manages the landscape in a way that uh, large-scale wildfire uh, becomes an impossibility. So traditionally they would burn in these mosaic patterns, allow areas to regenerate, they'd know how long it had been between burns so that they could go back and hunt kangaroos, wallaby and other animals. Uh, but the main game, I think, was to avoid the build-up of vegetation that would lead to a massive conflagration and, and the, um, the tragedy of wildfire. Uh, uh, an elder, Bill Nigy, uh, has published a, a little book called Gagajoo Man. I found it in a bookshop at Kakadu National Park. And he said that fire is nothing. And I thought that's a pretty good summary and a really brutal summary of what it means for humans to approach and manage fire in such a way that it's no longer an important part of their day-to-day -day, uh, risk assessment of living. And I was thinking how, how, how much Australia, in particular, has changed since the time of Aboriginal burning uh, on, a you know, on a systematic scale, uh, decreasing from 1788 onwards from the time of European colonisation. So he just sees fire as part of a, a cultural landscape where the use of the technology of fire against fire is the most effective way of dealing with the problem. So he also saw that fire was an asset. Uh, managing fire was part of culture, and also managing fire was part of uh, establishing a pattern, a rhythm within an ecosystem that was predictable, sort of like the phenology of fire, if you like. So the endemic ecology was maintained by this mosaic of burning over tens of thousands of years. Fire can also, in this context, be thought of as a positive psychoterratic state. And don't worry about the chart, I'm just going to give you a brief test on that at the end of <laughs> this talk after, after Vix. Uh, I expect you to memorise it. And I'm also doing an even bigger one on the negative psychoterratic states. But what you can see is that I've attempted to put together some well-known uh, uh, positive psychoterratic states like biophilia from uh, from and Wilson, topophilia from Tuan, the geographer, and a whole pile that I've put in that you've never seen before, and maybe I can convince <coughs> you that they're worthy of being put there. I'll mention just a couple in a second. So fire delivers positive psychoterratic emotions for free. I don't know about you, but I love fires. You know, I light them, I, uh, I chop wood, I keep myself warm with them. I look into a fire and I see uh, something which is almost eternal. We, we engage with fire in a way that is almost spiritual. 
So I think fire delivers a state of what I call UT area, which is uh, roughly translated a good earth feeling. I'm allergic to water, so I don't like the, you know, the surfy idea of that great oceanic feeling where they describe that moment where they're at one with the wave. Well, I, I, I'm a tree hugger, and so I experience <coughs> UT area. And I, I did want to call it Euterra, uh, but there was a porn star that had that name already, so I very quickly changed it to the Spanish, which turns out to be a good move because the Spanish-speaking countries, particularly in Latin America, have picked up my work and are now using a lot of my positive and negative terms simply because uh, there's a worldly aspect to it, not just an English language aspect. Um, and endemophilia the demos of the people, uh, endemic, the love of the locally endemic. That's a term that I created, and it would apply to the indigenous management of landscape because they don't just manage, they love their country. They treat it as something that needs to be cared for over long periods of time. So the, I would argue that the positive psychoterratic uh, aspects of our lives are uh, integral to being human. We've tended in the English-speaking world to ignore naming these emotions in the past because we could take them for granted. Like E.O. Wilson says in uh, Biophilia, we tend to go to the ocean and take a walk and get pleasure for reasons that we don't really understand. We just do it because we just want a good earth feeling. Well, as the ocean now becomes uh, cluttered with plastic and red tides wash up dead fish and, uh, you know, the Gulf of Mexico spews oil out onto your favourite beach, you can no longer go there and take for granted that you're going to have a good uh, oceanic feeling. So the UT area is no longer guaranteed. And in fact, if you read, say, from Bill McKibben's End of Nature onwards, the idea that you can find somewhere on Earth that's somehow untouched by humanity now is an impossibility. So I won't dwell on that because really uh, I'm well known for being depressing and negative, so I'll actually <coughs> stick, stick to that. This is pretty negative and depressing. We've had to change the uh, fire uh, ratings in Australia to add a new category. Extreme wasn't enough. We now have catastrophic fire danger warnings. And I've experienced three or four of them in the last few summers, where even fire fighters have to get out of the area. There's no way you can fight a catastrophic fire. You just have to let it burn until everything finishes. So we're now seeing the transition from fire is nothing in uh, Kakadu under Big Bill's management to, for some people, it's a bit dramatic to say it's everything, but you know it's pathetic to say it's almost everything. It's there for emphasis. That it's, it's now such a danger, uh, not only to Australians with their catastrophic fire danger warnings, but also to the Greeks, to the Portuguese, to the people of Oregon, people of British Columbia. Uh, there are so many places now experiencing catastrophic levels of wildfire. Oh, I forgot the Californians. Uh, it seems that we've shifted into a new uh, phase state on the planet where uh, even if the fire problem is uh, anthropogenic in the sense that humans light a lot of fires, the fires wouldn't become catastrophic unless the conditions to have large-scale fire were present. So huge sections of the earth are getting hotter and drier, and that means a spark uh, will start a fire, lightning will start a fire, a mechanic doing something on a, uh, on a machine can start a fire. So these are... A new fire regime has entered the, uh, the planet. It even enters our cities in Australia. In 2003, Canberra uh, burnt right into the interior of the city uh, with uh, a loss of life, unfortunately, and a loss of 500-odd uh, homes. Uh, I knew someone who lost their house in that fire, and it was a deeply traumatic experience for that person. They haven't actually recovered from that. So in Australia, we're not talking about wildfire in forests as they are in Sweden, managed forests for timber. Um, in Australia we, we can see forest uh, fires that then uh, burn and they, they, they sometimes come into the capital city of your nation. 
Fear of fire is now becoming ubiquitous. This is the Greek fires uh, in your northern summer where people had to flee into the ocean to try and get away from um, being um, either badly burnt or, or, or killed by fire. And so I would argue that the fear of fire is now returning as a psycho tyrannic emotion in the lives of humans uh, all over the, the world and in places that we never thought possible before, like who would have thought Sweden would burn? So the negative psychotyratic states, so this is the one I'm really going to test you on. I've taken out about uh, <coughs> 10 of them, not just to make a nice, neat chart that looks, looks quite useful, but it's, what's happening is that in my own work and in the work of other people, we're adding more and more negative psychotyratic terms to what I call this typology, the psychotyratic typology. So, you know, nostalgia started the, the game in 1688 that traditionally defined as homesickness when you're away from home. It was a psychological and medical problem. You, you could die of nostalgia as defined by Hoffer, and it was particularly concerning people who were absent from home and who wished to return, but their absence was forced on them, like soldiers fighting on a foreign shore. So that's, that's where I started to look for the meaning of psychotyratic terms. And of course, nostalgia now means a kind of sick, sick, sweet sentimentality about a place where you'd rather be in time. You know, like some people actually want to live at the time of Elvis Presley. I can't imagine why, but you know, that's the kind of nostalgia <coughs> that we have now. Actually, I like Elvis, it's all right. Um, and more recently, we've got people like um, Wilson again and his mate Kellett talking about biophobia. I'll talk about solastalgia in a minute. Uh, Richard Louvre talks about nature deficit disorder. Bill Rees and others have talked about eco-paralysis, and I'll mention uh, that separately. Uh, eco-anxiety has been around for about uh, a few decades now. And the others are created by me to fill in gaps in what I consider to be the emerging world that requires of us a response in language. Not because I like creating words or that I'm a social construction of reality kind of guy. I'm not. I'm a realist. The world's changed. We need new concepts to actually describe the, the way this world is, uh, is changing. So, speaking of eco I need some water. So, eco anxiety, uh, a form of anxiety that is generalised, but it means that people are no longer feeling comfortable with their support environment. They feel that, that something out of their control is becoming hostile to their needs and their want. It was a, uh, created by a journalist in 1990 in an article about um, uh, an area of the United States that was experiencing environmental degradation. So, it's a good example of a psychotheoretic word that's come from the popular context, popular culture, and has entered into uh, academic discourse. Meteor anxiety, I created that because everybody gets anxious about the weather at times, but now because we've got smartphones, we've got the Bureau of Meteorology that can deliver warnings about what's going to come next, whether they're right or wrong, uh, and as a result, we, we start getting this form of anxiety connected to the weather and the fact is that we're getting more uh, um, extreme weather of various kinds hitting humanity in various parts of the world more often. But when I go to Canada, which I, I used to do when I was uh, a fully paid up academic for sabbatical leave, I have a channel called the Weather Channel. They just run the same story over and over again, but I was hypnotised by it because you could see you know, the tornado warnings, you could see the hurricane warnings, you could see the dangers of whatever it was that was coming up next. And every, every subsequent time you saw it just made you more anxious than you were before. Um, I've experienced meteor anxiety on Wallaby Farm. Uh, it was 47 <coughs> degrees last summer on one day and it was so hot that the eucalypts were just shedding their leaves the European and, uh, and flower vegetation was just burning, you know, it was just literally burning in front of me. And the, the, the eucalyptus, when it gets really hot, delivers a, uh, a, a, a volatile haze or vapour, 
which is literally explosive. If, if somebody lit a match, I joke sometimes that if someone even farted, there would be a massive explosion where the eucalyptus forest would just simply burst into flames and would all be absolutely collated. <coughs> so that disturbing feeling that the, 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 the current meteorological environment was so hostile that it could actually uh, be apocalyptic was uh, what I consider to be extreme meteor anxiety. So much so that I'm frightened at, at, at the coming summer. I can't actually uh, leave my property during the summer. And it's going to be 35 on Wallaby Farm later this week. So it's not as if by coming in our spring I've avoided uh, you know, not being there when the place burns down. Um, I mentioned <coughs> eco-paralysis. There's so complex, there's so many variables. This trade-off between all the things that humans want uh, ends up causing us to do nothing. And so uh, René Lertzman, Bill Reeves and myself have been using this concept for at least a decade now, uh, trying to understand why it is that people don't do anything in the face of all of these threats. And the consensus is they're not doing anything, uh, not, well, how do I put it? It's not because they're apathetic or they don't care. They care so much that they're frozen in the choices available to them that are all contradictory. So I, I describe it quickly here as these complex trade-offs. So nostalgia. Now, you have to yell at me when I'm going close okay. to my time. Yep, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Because uh, I know that this is a, a shared event. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be strictly <coughs> according to the principles of justice. All right. Well, that's the Hunter Valley. That's open cut coal mining. There's methane spewing out. They call it fugitive emissions. I think it's a really good term. But so nostalgia, the bottom line says it's the homesickness you have when you're still at home. And what I mean by that is that your home environment, which you love, which gave you solace, is now being taken away from you by forces that you no longer have control over. And so it's almost as if your home is leaving you rather than you leaving home. That makes the quite clear uh, difference between nostalgia as traditionally defined and soul nostalgia as defined by me. So this lived experience, attacking your sense of place, delivers desolation if, uh, in both the landscape and in the landscape of the mind. So that's where the idea of soul nostalgia comes from. That's an open cut in the Hunter Valley. I'll have to point this out to you because it's really hard to see. Um, that's an electric shovel or drag line, which is one of the largest machines that's made on the face of the earth. This open cut is literally uh, this machine taking out coal at the bottom layer, and so they take it out and it creates a void, and they make spoiled heaps or mountains, flat top mesas with the, the stuff they take out. So from here to there is a kilometre and a half, it's about half a kilometre wide, and it's getting close to half a kilometre deep now. And it's still going. Um, so you can see, and that's what remains of the Hunter Valley. This is at Musselbrook, which was famous as a thoroughbred horse breeding area. So uh, next door is Rosemont uh, Wines. They won a uh, World's Best <coughs> Chardonnay one, one year. Now uh, their area is uh, gone. So yeah, uh, soul nostalgia actually is related to an in-your-face physical change to the biophysical environment. It's not a subtle point about uh, the uncanny or the unconscious. Soul nostalgia for indigenous people, uh, some of them who still live in that area, uh, avoid the mind areas by driving hundreds of unnecessary kilometres so that they can't see it. It's just too distressing for them. It makes you wild. And some nostalgia is also something that can be overcome by repair of damaged landscapes. Some people interpret my work as it's, it's, it's gone forever. Well, nothing's gone forever. There's something still there. And if people want to, they can bring it back. But the good thing about drought is that it's uh, alleviated by rain. So nostalgia can be created by drought. The forest can grow back. 
eucalyptus forests can grow back amazingly quickly. But now in Australia, for the first time, our um, alpine forests are burning. And they don't come back. And we're now seeing these European forests burning. Some of them will take hundreds of years to even get any kind of semblance of the northern boreal forest uh, that um, they uh, uh, encapsulate, encapsulate. And of course, their own, your own native people in the northern hemisphere are now experience the loss of their landscape intimately connected to their uh, uh, way of living, uh, how, the way they make their living uh, with respect to uh, their, their reindeer. So my Solastalgia friends in Sweden are now studying the impact of wildfire on the, the sun people. Transborder issues and smoke. Well, smoke is not just smoke. I mean, we have to now start thinking really clearly about what it is that we are witnessing. And uh, this new fire regime is, is, is so powerful and so extensive that we're beginning to see transborder smoke issues. So the fires in Portugal end up covering the, uh, the lands of, of Great Britain. And it's happened before, and Arms are familiar with it. You know, Krakatoa blew up in the 1880s, and Munch painted this in response to the blood red skies that were being produced the world over as a result of the dust that was ejected into the sky from Krakatoa. And so, this infinite scream that went through the world that Munch described is actually a, a psychotoratic response to a change in the biophysical environment. It just not, not many people are that attuned to what's going on in the environment to even think that this is something really weird. I don't know, there's probably a better word. Um, there are other people who are sensitive enough to the way the, the world is changing to actually think about it. Well, we don't have a word for these red clouds that are coming from Portugal that are giving places like Wales where the, uh, Jenny Batson uh, lives uh, these blood red skies. So she's created a word to describe these blood red clouds that have been formed by the wildfires of Portugal and Spain. She also, I gave her this word because she, she made the point without creating a new psychotheoretic term. So I thought, okay, we're going to have to create one. We can call it death smoke, but I like mort smoke. Um, fire is, uh, you know, produces smoke from the, the burnt remains of living things. And so when you're experiencing smoke coming across from the Iberian Peninsula into, uh, into Wales, uh, you're actually experiencing you know, these uh, carbon atoms from the recently dead. So it's a very powerful experience when you begin to think about what it is that smoke is now representing. It's no longer this inert, abs abstract, you know, cloudy type thing. Um, th that photo was uh, one I took uh, last week in Sweden, where the landscape was burnt to a crisp. Rocks cracked, it was so hot. So you have to think about what smoke and fire means now in a psychotheoretic way. So beyond solastalgia and beyond the other terms that I've briefly touched on, uh, there's a lot of work to be done by people who are sensitive enough and open enough to the way the world's changing to realise that we need some kind of response which is both emotional and conceptual. And hopefully our conceptual responses will map and match the, uh, the, the, the changing landscape. Defining the negative, I would argue, also sharpens our attention on well, what are we losing every time we create a, a new negative psychotheoretic term? Well, we're losing a positive one, which hitherto hadn't been named. So I've created a whole new era that follows the Anthropocene, which I see as an unmitigated bloody disaster. And that's a, oh, that's a brief Australian way of putting it. Uh, as a result, you know, I, I've created a new era where we build positive Earth emotions around the concept of symbiosis and living together with uh, not only other human beings but other living things at all scales from the microbiome to the macrobiome. And that's work in progress and my book will certainly uh, offer a lot more on that and on my blog, Psychotoratica, you can find 
hastily drafted, poorly written essays and poorly edited ones that uh, will say more about it. And finally, uh, Kate McDowell <coughs> and her amazing art is featured on the, the now uh, approved to be shared book cover for mm -hmm. Earth and Nations, which comes out next year. So I think it, it does capture an essence of my thinking, which is that I do have a koala lodged somewhere in the middle of my brain. And it does actually generate a really important insight into uh, the, my relationship to the Earth, which is that uh, koala dreaming uh, is becoming hard to bear in Australia now, if you'll excuse the pun. Uh, it's because uh, all koala habitat is under threat. Koalas live in the areas of eastern Australia that are totally favoured by human beings. So guess what? Um, the only place uh, we'll have them, and uh, some people argue in less than 50 years, will be locked inside somebody's head. So, New Words for a New World uh, was my suggestion for a subtitle because I do believe we're entering, entering a world that uh, is radically different from the one that uh, the Holocene and all past human experience delivered. And I think the, the New World is both positive and negative in the sense that if the anthrop Anthropocene wins, um, we're going to have to have a lot of new words and they're not going to be long-lived because more are humans. Uh, if we uh, create the Symbiocene, there'll be a lot of new positive psychoterratic words and we'll all be happy and the birds will sing and children will play. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to, to hold your questions and comments um, uh, until Pick has done his presentation. Um, and um, so Pick uh, is also Australian. Um, he's the artistic director of an, an arts organisation called the CAD Factory. Um, and uh, he's going to talk about his art practice. Um, but um, his work has uh, developed very much working with communities, working with, with partners um, in particular locations and working with some of the, in some of the similar terrain to that um, which Glenn has been conceptualising, particularly around um, environmental trauma, loss, uh, solastalgia. Um, he was tw 2015 artist in residence in the National Museum of Australia and he was the recipient of the inaugural Create New South Wales Regional Fellowship. And he shared work um, in the Tate, uh, Tate Liverpool and also in the National Gallery of, New, uh, of uh, Lithuania. And his work also um, is, is, is very um, transdisciplinary, um, including questions of health and well-being, um, as, as is um, Glenn's. And he's actually he's on the New South Wales um, ACT Arts and Health State Leadership Group, among other things. And he's going to be talking today uh, on something with an intriguing title, The Butterfly Kiss. <coughs> Mark three. Mark three. Thank you very much, Vic. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for having me here. I've been in the UK for a day and a half, and I've been up for 20 hours already. So yeah. <laughs> it feels like I'm giving a talk at 2 a.m. So hopefully that's good fun for all of us. Um, as Kate mentioned, I run an organisation called the CAD Factory. We're a regionally based organisation, kind of in between Sydney and Melbourne, but inland, even more in the heart of our industrialised agriculture region of New South Wales. And our arts organisation um, has a firm belief in working away from art institutions mostly and working deeply within communities, often around issues, um, difficult issues of lived reality uh, for people in place <coughs> out in the landscape. At the heart of our practice is what we call, you know, that our contemporary arts practice is led by the map of people in place. And by map we're referring to the materiality, the affect and performativity of those places. So that's what guides us in our, in our art making process. I'm going to just set the scene for my talk by playing a short 40 minute video which is um, being spoken by a Wiradjuri elder, Uncle Bob. And the image that you're going to see is a, is a one single still image from a, a Dreamtime story of the region. Um, and this image is, is projected 50 metres wide across the Great Murrumbidgee River uh, near Canberra. 
being animated by the landscape, being animated by fog and smoke in the region rather than being animated by a computer. I'm just going to play this short. My name is Bob Lanville. I'm the Aboriginal Wiradjuri elder in Kudamunda, the home of the Gadogunaray Wiradjuri people. The, all the land of Australia and, and uh, the, the West Indies and uh, Indonesia <coughs> and Tasmania were all one. They all joined as one. So you see all those animals there, different animals there, that, that was at the birth, of, the birth of time. You can see that massive hill in the background, which is... The birth of all things. Mm -hmm. With fog and smoke uh, blowing down the mountain region. So I'm going to return to that story um, later in the talk. So across five states, uh, states and territories of Australia is the Great Murray-Darling Basin, which consists of a number of major interconnected river systems, including the Darling, the Lachlan, the Murrumbidgee and the Murray Rivers, to name just a few. Within this large region, uh, region industrialised and other types of agriculture use more than 80% of the water that is within the basin to produce a third of the nation's food. Our home is located in a small town called Narandra, which sits on, the, sits on the banks of the mighty Murrumbidgee River. Murrumbidgee is a Wiradjuri language word, which means big water, or as one local elder told me, big water, he who must be obeyed. <laughs> These rivers flow individually and then connect, conflux after conflux, as they make their way towards the mouth of the system near Gulwa in South Australia. This is a photograph of that entire basin region entering the ocean. Uh, Gula. This photograph is back in one of the kind of healthier times of the river system and this is a more recent photograph where you can see that because of the low flow of water um, there isn't quite enough force to, to push the sand and the silt and the, the debris that comes down from the river system out into the ocean. So this region is continually being dredged in the, 2000 for, in the 2000s uh, for nine years, full-time, non-stop, this area is being dredged to try to stop the mouth of it um, being closed. So the mouth of our great Murray-Darling Basin uh, river system. As these river systems flow through the Australian landscape, they present a great problem to humankind. And that is, how can we cooperate beyond our self-interest? How can we understand this asset, or this river, as having a particular value to ourselves, but also a different value to others? These landscapes within the Murray-Darling Basin are home to at least 35 endangered species of birds, 16 endangered species of man mammals, <coughs> and 46 known species of native fish. From the very moment the source of water starts to flow in this great basin, the human demand on its water becomes a point of conflict. You can see here um, images of protests that have happened when Murray-Darling Basin plans have been released. This is when the last plan was released where people took to the street, burned the plans in the street because they disagreed with the, with the use of water in the system. So nobody can agree, it seems. The state of New South Wales demands that water should be allowed to be removed because it provides most of the country's agriculture. South Australia argues that it needs the water for both agriculture but also for tourism, where it gains a lot of its income. And then there's the argument that we need water for environmental flows to service some of the great wetlands that are fed off this system. Unfortunately, because the area is so controlled by dams and water licences, there is no, um, or there has historically has been no water left in the river system for environmental flows. As one Rotary elder once observed to me, the Murrumbidgee River now flows backwards. Because it's controlled by dams, it's now high in summer because there's a release of water for irrigation. And in winter, when it's normally full, um, because water is being kept back to fill the dams, it's now, this is now the time when we're actually getting no water in the system. So it's running contrary to how it has in the past. Here's a photo of the plans being burnt in the streets in Griffith, which is about 100 kilometres west of us. When we moved to this region, there was a lot of contention from people saying, oh my God, artists have moved into the region. What are we going to do? What are they here for? And then just a year later, <coughs> um, it was farmers taking to the street protesting mm -hmm. on the streets um, about water allocation. So in 2013, Canberra, which is our capital city, held their centenary celebrations. Amidst the year-long festival was a project called One River, which commissioned 10 artists, or groups of artists, along the length of the entire Murray-Darling Basin, to make work about the river. <coughs> it 
we were commissioned to make it work in our town and then to take the outcome to Canberra to share with the national audience there. And so it began a long and complex relationship with the river system through art making, through the river system's management and with water. For One River we made a show called Tipping Point. To make Tipping Point we worked in collaboration with five people with different relationships to the river system. Uncle Cedric Briggs, who was a Yorta Yorta elder and grew up on two missions, one on the Murrumbidgee and one on the Murray Rivers. As a child, Uncle Cedric was part of the great Cumragunja mission walk-off, where in an act of self-determination, Aboriginal people left the mission, something that was outlawed and an illegal act at the time. We also worked with a farmer who was practising industrialised farming methods, a farmer developing new environmental farming methods a water lawyer who saw water as a tradable commodity, and the mayor of a local town who talked about the 10-year drought <coughs> and how he worked to help a town cope with his hardship. Each of these stories was presented on, as a large projection work on the facade of an old brewery which sits on the bank of the river, and the whole community came to watch. The project had many successes. The art was a success, gaining favourable reviews from national media, but the real success, from our opinion, was measured by a certain type of comment which we received as feedback. It was mentioned by a number of people along something along the lines of, Tipping Point was the first time we'd been able to come together and discuss opposing views on water management on the river system, <coughs> on the river system without it ending in near violence. <laughs> Tipping Point allow us to solve any of the issues around water management in the Murray-Darling Murray Basin? No, it didn't. But it did allow us to enable communication to happen between people with opposing views, something that for some reason we seem to struggle with. I've long had an interest in my arts practice working far away from art institutions and instead placing it deep within the functioning aspects, aspects of society. In this case with water management and with community. It was around this point that I started to understand something that was something that has become the foundation to my arts practice, and that is in order to address complex issues practically, we need to first understand how to address them emotionally. I see contemporary arts practice as a perfect medium to aid this emotional navigation. Tipping Point allowed such a navigation to occur and resulted in people's first experiences of non-aggressive communication between opposing views about water. <coughs> My next extended artistic exploration of water um, came following major flooding that happened in the township of Yenda, not far from Griffith, where those protests happened. Yenda is a town which shouldn't have flooded because it's not on the river system. However, the floods came um, to this town through the irrigation channels that have been put through the entire region to service the agriculture that makes up much of the Murray-Darling Basin. So in this town, people went to work one day and started receiving text messages saying, you can't come back home, the town is shut. If you had children in the local school, they've been taken 70 kilometres away and they're in the school now. So the town was then shut for nearly a month. No one was able to return home. Nobody in the region had any sort of training for how do we, how do we respond to a flood because no flood was ever expected. And nobody had any flood insurance. So most people in this town lost their homes, all of their possessions and had no insurance to recover it. So I was told one story of an elderly man who walked into the bank and dropped his keys on the counter and said, you have it and disappeared, nobody saw him again. You don't know where he went. And so I was asked to go to the town to meet with the town to discuss whether there was an arts project that could maybe help now that all the emergency services had left and there was nothing there to help some of the people recover from this experience, if maybe through contemporary arts practice there might be something to offer. The day before I met the mayor had announced $4 million for infrastructure um, to be put into this region. And when I asked how much was being put into the recovery of people, he said, zero dollars. And so there was no plan to enable the emotional recovery of people in this situation. And so I started working in the town over, over an entire year. During that year, people were slowly returning to their homes, some of them rebuilding it themselves. Maybe 10 or 15% of people were able to get um, insurance for their houses. And I would spend the evenings with houses, people on their first night back in town as a as family members broke down in tears, thinking they would feel grateful to be back in their house, but understanding it's not their house anymore, it's not their town anymore. When people were first allowed back in, the mismanagement of it was so terrible that they didn't, they didn't realise that maybe it would be a good idea to clear up the mounds of pets that were nearly as tall as this building through the local streets, and they had gathered up the bodies of pets of local people. So people were returning to this sort of environment, which 
nobody really knew how to manage. And so I worked with this community for a year in one of the incredibly complex um, situation. For me as an artist, mostly because the support committee that was being established to, to help me, including a mental health worker, a local councillor, some local community members, kind of fell apart for various reasons. So I was just in this town on my own, navigating the emotional sort of devastation and recovery that was happening and having to, being looked at um, from local people as having some sense of responsibility to, to hold their story carefully. And through a year of very close um, relationships with community members in their homes, we ended up developing a, a show that kind of, a series of installations around the whole town where after a year of working there, <coughs> it was the first time where people in the town came together as a group to be together and walk the streets of their town to see um, some of the installations that we made. And they consisted of, you know, a number of things. So one of them was a local sculptor in town, Harpy Kittle, talked to me about how when he was at home when the water started coming in, and there were some kids um, playing in the street, and as the water started rising, some of them were picking up huge carps that were down the main street, large carps and walking down the street with these massive fish in their hand. And he's made, he's carved this beautiful thing which he calls a fish rider, of this young child nestled on there. This is a drawing that he did of it. And so this became a symbol of the project. Um, the end of rain. And for the night of installation, you can see this, uh, maybe you can't see it there, but it's, this is projected from a large um, scissor lift down onto the sand of a playground. And this was just swimming around the playground all night as kids came and, and played, with the, uh, played with the images there. And so working in Yenda for that year, as I mentioned, it became a very complex thing. Murrumbidgee Irrigation, who run the irrigation channels in that area, when the um, flooding happened, there was, of course, class actions um, suing Murrumbidgee Irrigation. Their CEO, CEO decided to leave at that point and was replaced by a lawyer. So a lawyer became the CEO of Murrumbidgee Irrigation. And of course, they wouldn't, during that year, I phoned them a number of times to discuss the project and they wouldn't talk to me about it and said they couldn't talk to me because there's class actions <coughs> uh, happening. The reason why the floods happened in this town was because where the irrigation channel is, there's two systems that allow an overflow of water to escape the system if, if it happens. So on one side there was a system of big cement um, blocks that could be lifted up by two strong people in the, in the case of water coming down the system. But because this was just four or five years after the 10-year drought, during that drought one year when there was a small leak in one of these things, they decided to cement it all over. So the blocks actually couldn't be removed when, when the time came, when a flood was coming. On the other side of the irrigation channels was an automated system that was meant to, once a certain amount of pressure came, open up this gate so the water could flow out into a naturally occurring creek um, that was flowing in another direction. And of course that um, gate was installed back to front, so water couldn't actually flow out. So despite all this, Murrumbidgee Irrigation still refused to accept responsibility for the, for the flooding. Um, and so I'd often have, you know, times when I was in town and staying at people's houses and if it rained, seeing the whole family being up all night because they were scared that rain was coming. What if the town floods again? And so Murrumbidgee Irrigation refused to fix any of these because they saw it as a sign of liability. And so after my many months of phoning Murrumbidgee Irrigation and trying to get them involved in the project, I decided two weeks out of when we were having our big public event, I phoned them and said, the location where this all happened, where the two things are, I'm actually going to hold the major installation out there and invite the whole town out to that location. <laughs> and then the night before, I was taking all of those people out there. We walked out there just to check it all and set things up. And uh, of course, they couldn't fix the side that was installed uh, back to front, but they had removed all the cement and fixed one <laughs> side of it secretly under the cover of night. It was just magically um, appeared. So it became a thing where I was thinking, wow, that's the greatest artwork I've ever made. <laughs> It was an artist who, who enabled Murrumbidgee Irrigation to secretly go and remove that, but what that <laughs> meant for the town was that they slept when it rained. Even though they didn't have any money, even though I was still going through court cases, they were able to sleep when it rained. And so my relationship with, with the river system and with water um, has continued since then. And as Kate mentioned, in 2015, I was lucky enough to be the artist in residence at the National Museum of Australia, where I got to work with the collection there and with curators, including George Main. I believe maybe you were one of his PhD supervisors. I examined his wonderful, wonderful PhD. It is. I've read that. It's beautiful. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So George and I had similar interests in um, regional Australia and life in regional Australia. Him from 
as a historian, as a curator of the National Museum, and me as a contemporary artist. And so we worked together um, during that year, and we made a number of works. And one of them was a work called Haunting, which that first video with Uncle Bob Granville, we saw the thylacine project on the river, was made from. And the idea of Haunting was to um, look at some of the images that are in the National Museum collection, and mostly based around the work of William Farrer, who was responsible for developing strains of wheat that allowed agriculture to move into, into inland Australia. And William Farrer actually had his lab on the, up near the very start of the Murrumbidgee, which flows four or five hundred kilometres down to where I live and then joins the Murrumbidgee <coughs> many more hundred kilometres away. He had his actual lab there, which is now a historic home <coughs> on the Murrumbidgee. And so we decided to look at his um, wheat samples, which are celebrated in the National Museum. There's a big pyramid of the wheat, sam wheat samples talking about how they opened up inland Australia to agriculture. But there's no real comments about um, the other side of that, the loss of species that occurred uh, because of that loss of people, the genocide that's occurred um, because, of the, because of those developments. And so we decided to, to work with images such as the, that collection of wheat samples and to project them into fog that naturally occurred on the Murrumbidgee River. So we got permission to, for the, with the owners of William Farrer's Historic House and we set up a massive National Museum of Australia projector in a weatherproof enclosure on the banks of the Murrumbidgee uh, for three months. And we spent many nights out there waiting for fog to roll down the river. <laughs> and after two months, we hadn't got any fog. Um, and we were working with a Bureau of Meteorology who were trying to predict when there was fog, because of course, I had to drive 400 kilometers each time we were trying to work um, on the site. And they, of course, you know, saying, if you could move the location, then we could predict fog very well for you. But <clears throat> at this location, we can't. And so it was about two months, and then one night George and I were driving there at about 1 a.m., and as we were driving in, we noticed fog rolling down the Murrumbidgee, and my voice went two octaves higher, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at that exact moment, George drove his car into a wombat hole that we were driving across, <coughs> and he couldn't get it out. It was actually stuck up in the air like that. And so we just went, forget the car, and we grabbed everything from the car and started running down to the riverbank where the projectors um, were, so we could turn everything on and start projecting and photographing because there was fog um, <coughs> down the river system. And so some of these images, I was interested in doing this because I wanted to see what happened, what would it mean, what other meanings would we gain from these images as they were abstracted and changed from the animation that would occur from naturally occurring <coughs> environmental conditions, or as the Bureau of Meteorologist, um, I called him a weatherman once, but he's a meteorologist, he was offended because I called him a weatherman. Um, <coughs> he would discuss how Say, for example, if a farmer and the farm next door was burning off one day, an old, sort of outdated, terrible farming practice that still happens a lot in Australia, um, that all the debris in the air can actually cause a fog. So we saw that, you know, some, it was the ide ideology of some farmers that were creating some weather conditions that were going to be animating our images and to see how that would, how that would add meaning to these images beyond animating them through a computer. So, for example, we took a seed grinding stone that was found near our region and with uh, a local elder gave us permission to be using for the project and projected it. This was that night, this was one of the first images we projected. Um, that, that's that exact same photograph projected into fog over the river system. And we work with things like this map of Yunani Hirinya where um, Dame Mary Gilmore, who's was on our $5 note, I think, and did some amazing work. She's a poet, um, did amazing work about transferring Wiradjuri knowledge um, once settlers, colonisers were developing farming in the region. This is a plan, a plan of the property where first her grandparents and then parents uh, were from. That's that same image projected. This is 50 metres wide over the Murrumbidgee um, River. But of course, this is a still image and this was moving in the, as the fog shifted in, in the region. And this is one of uh, Mary Gilmore's typewriter, which I think George was responsible for finding and, and bringing into the museum. The same image projected into fog. It's a series of wheat bags, so I'm waiting for transport at the train station, which is how that transport used to happen. So all of these are items from the National Museum of Australia's collection. 
And some of them are quite amazing, the mm -hmm. colour, the vibrancy of colours and the directions of some of the light. Um, I've had professors of photography load look, look at these photos saying, how, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. The way some of these um, kind of appear. So there's a remarkable body of photographic and video work that have come from this that's um, slowly moving through the bureaucracy of the National Museum to three years in now to hopefully tour the country for a couple of years um, from next year. And so, so this work was kind of the start of me trying to understand about the materiality of place and how, how we can work um, in collaboration with environmental conditions to try to create new visual forms and therefore try to enable new discussions through them. So at the moment I've come to the UK for several reasons and one is to con continue this project which I call Specimen, which is working with the National Museum of Australia's um, Specimen Collection. So these specimen in jars, like any details, records of their origin, rendering them internally dislocated from their own histories, from the timescales and landscapes in which they lived. Instead, they sit preserved in toxic formaldehyde. Many of the specimens represent species heavily impacted by human activity. By projecting photographs of their ghost-like presences back onto the landscape, Specimen invites audiences to attend to and consider their relationship with the natural environment and its non-human community. Anima animated by place, the final photographs render these specimens both present and absent in a changing environment. In Australia, I've been pr uh, projecting these specimen images. So this is a kangaroo embryo in a pouch, in a jar. So these were collected in the early 1900s. There's no records for these. We don't actually know where they were collected or how. They were collected. There's over 2,000 of them in the National Museum of Australia's specimen collection. There's also a section behind a curtain of human remains, but I'm not, I'm not working with those. Um, and of course, they're a really hard thing for curators to work with because they can't be moved because they're so delicate. This is a koala, a set of koala paw in a jar. So I've been working with some of these images um, and projecting them onto places related to colon the colonisation of Australia. And so this image is that specimen um, koala point, a specimen jar. This was an image I took last January. This is on the River Thames. So some of the first fleet ships had a life down the river before they um, sailed to Australia. And as um, most of you probably know, there's that period of the day where the, the tide goes really low on the Thames and you can get down there onto the bank and it reveals this sort of moss-covered wall. And so we're travelling to these places and projecting some of these images and... In Australia, for example, we're inviting groups, indigenous groups, local farmers, to sit and have conversations together about what these images mean. Are people able to feel an emotional, emotional connection to them by us returning them into the landscape via projection? What does it mean for indigenous people who some of these animals are their totems, have cultural meaning and cultural significance uh, to them? What does it mean for them to see these return back into a landscape where they were once common but now often no longer exist? This image was down in um, Portsmouth where the first fleet ships left from when they came out to Australia. So this is on some of the old historic um, walls there. And I've also been capturing sound at some of these places. So these bars that you see here, I was able to discover some beautiful tones. That now there can be a nice soundtrack made from these. You know, the historic um, bars that were there when the first fleet 
left that location. We worked out the um, Arthur Phillip Monument in London. Arthur Phillip was, of course, celebrated for all the great work that he did, um, the perception of all the great work that he did, sort of not <laughs> taking into account other things that he was responsible for back in Australia, in particular the treatment of Aboriginal people. And this is an image of a kangaroo embryo on the Murrumbidgee, just uh, not far, 10 minutes from where I live, um, on the banks of the Murrumbidgee, <coughs> returning that, that image. When we go back in a few weeks, we're having three nights there with local Indigenous groups and some of the large industrialised farmers, many of whom have never sat with an Aboriginal person before, mm -hmm. to have a discussion about some of these and what the meanings of these animals are after them. And this again, I think it's quite astounding that this is a animal in a jar, but how alive it looks, how, how much life is in it when you just project it back into this landscape. Of course, one night when we were at this location, it was quite windy and the movement of these trees made it quite kind of ghostly. This location was actually an emu sanctuary that um, Mary Dane Gilmore actually wrote poems about um, this, this location in Wagga Wagga, uh, about 100 kilometres from where I live. And so um, in two days we go down to Plymouth, where Captain Cook first left um, when he discovered Australia. And so we're going to go down and do some projections there. And then um, when we get back, we'll be working with the Aboriginal community around Cornell and Botany, where he landed. Um, the Australian government have recently announced $250 million to be budgeted for a monument to Captain Cook at that location. So $250 million, quite a substantial amount of money. And so we're going to be returning with some of these images and working with the local Aboriginal community there to document some of their responses to give to the National Museum, who have been given a portion of that money to do some sort of celebrations to offer this back um, to, as some sort of voice from the local community. Although I know that the aims of the National Museum are to include some of those uh, voices, but it's been quite a controversial thing, the $250 million to a Captain Cook monument, to a statue, basically, um, a monument at that location in that very place. And so this project will continue um, into some of these sort of areas of significance and gathering, not, not being as a show like something like Tipping Point was, where the aim was to have massive audiences, but more about just having small groups of people to record, to video and record and then document conversations that happened, feelings that were had, things that were said um, from these things. And so the Cat Factory, the practice that we... Um, work on, you know, often exists around sort of complex issues that people have to negotiate, whether that's between themselves or against a system or against the history of colonisation, for example. Um, and as I sort of slowly start to wrap up, I'm going to play this video, which is a... from the Project Horning, which is a photograph of a railway bridge that was in Wagga Wagga that was built there as agricultural ag agriculture started needing better me means of transport to to bring supplies in and out. And this um, photograph of this railway bridge, which here is a mixture of, there's a large fire happening over here, and there's also thick fog, and this is about four o'clock in the morning across the Murrumbidgee River. And I played this to Auntie Faye Clayton, who's a local rangery elder, who was one of the stolen generation. So she was taken as a child from her home, locked up in Kudamundra Girls' home, she was trained to be a domestic servant, we called it. It's quite shocking to find out that you know we had slavery in Australia. That, um, this soundtrack is created by playing the paddle steam that they used to have a life down the river system by playing it with cello bows. This entire soundscape. Um, so when I, I played this to Auntie Faye Clayton when I went to visit her one day and as she sat, started watching this, this video, she was, was breaking up a bit there. Um, she just started crying, just soft tears coming out of her eyes. And she was, and she, as she was telling me about her life at Cuda Mundra Girl, her girl's home was saying, this is what they've done to me, my life has been in a fog because I was taken. And she just sat and stared at this video and just quite amazing as this haunting project was unfolding and sharing it with her as we were doing this long journey for her to offer that back into the project as we were as we were working on it for her to offer that um, that comment of history and that comment of, of culture and the effect that that's had and how this 
made some sort of sense to her because as a child she thought the railway only existed to take away Aboriginal people. She didn't realise it had another purpose because she was taken in trains full of other Aboriginal girls to Kudamundra. So that was the meaning that this had. So this video had made complete sense to her of just this image. Um, sorry that it's so bad. So when we talk about our arts practice being guided by the map, which we term as the materiality, affect and performativity of people in place, we feel like we are taking ideas of critical theory and making them practical. We're making them part of our lived reality and the lived reality of the people and places that we work with. This project, Horning, allowed us to explore the materi materiality of place in relationship to the past history of agricultural development in Australia and the modern day consequences of this. The project Yender Rain and Tipping Point allowed us to explore issues of affect within the lived experience of navigating complex issues within our landscape. The project Specimen explores all of these things, including the performativity of these actions and the reactions they cause. And to finish up, in 2016, I spent um, a day in the home, home of uh, Deborah Bird Rose. Um, I was working on a project called Shadow Places, which was based on some of the work of Val Plumwood. Um, discussing shadow places, the places that we rely on but don't have any connection to. So in terms of where I'm from, which is a major agricultural development region, we might consider that that's a shadow place of people in the cities who rely on it for food and fibre production but have no relationship to it. They have no knowledge of it, they don't visit it, they don't know it, they don't care for it. Um, and so I spent a day with Deborah talking about this concept and she was just sharing me, with me her, her thoughts or her knowledge of um, Val Plumwood, who was a friend and colleague of hers. And when I was there, she was telling me about Val's funeral. So when Val passed away and was buried on Plumwood Mountain into the... Were you... Did you, yeah, I was there. You were there, yeah. Um, so she was buried onto the, into the actual mountain of whose name she took the surname of. And Deborah related to me that what she was struck with when she arrived was, was the range of people that were at the funeral. So it wasn't just academics, but there was indigenous groups, there was feral kind of activists there. And it was really struck her the wide range of people that Val's work actually touched. Um, she then related a story how, as because um, the body was on view before it was put onto the ground, there was a moment where a butterfly came out of the forest and landed on Val's shoulder, I think, and then it. F There's a little bit more to it actually. Yeah. The butterfly appeared when we were standing in circle, each of us in turn remembering something about Val, and this great big butterfly, it was about that big, um, went from shoulder to shoulder of yeah. all the people standing in a circle. Yeah which was kind of weird. Um, and then when we took the coffin down to the gravesite, the butterfly came with us, and it just, just kept on kind of flying around, and we were putting fruit and stuff onto the open, into the open um, coffin, and you might know the rest of it. Well, about what happened to the coffin? Well... You can tell yeah, that. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I'll sit down. It was pretty extraordinary. Um, the, um, Debbie was just wondering, when is enough enough? When, when are we going to put the lid on this damn coffin and actually lower it into the ground? Um, and at that point, she's discussing it with somebody else who they were conducting the funeral together. At that point, this great big butterfly landed on a big flower, sensibly enough, that was actually on Val's breast, on her chest, over her heart. Landed on it, and then just flew, whoops, straight up into the air and disappeared. And um, Debbie said, that's it. Now we'll put the wrong coffin where it's done. Is that what you remember? <laughs> I do remember that part, yeah. yeah. Um, and the part, the part that really struck me apart from all of that was, was how the butterfly flew around and landed on everybody's shoulder mm -hmm. that was in this group and the people were noticing that and reflecting on that as, as it was happening and this butterfly that they'd seen come from the mountain, how it was a part mm -hmm. of the mountain sort of being with Val and her friends at that um, period of time. And Deborah told me how there was one person who had landed on their cheek. And so it's from that point where I, you know, at the, the cat factory now understands its arts practice as that butterfly kiss, mm -hmm. as a thing of, about bringing people together. So as we, you know, in the next year we're looking at doing a number of projects, one's working around the high rate of suicide in the wider region where we live. Some of it could be argued as, could be because of climate change and environmental change, some of it's from many other reasons. Um, also in the Fall Creek, Falls Creek Alpine region, they commissioned recently um, an independent report to be done on the effects of climate change on the Alpine region of Falls Creek. And the report came back saying that within as little as three to ten years, the ski season is going to be reduced from 12 weeks a year to three weeks. 
a massive change in, in the amount of snow in the, in the region. And the region, apart from being you know, a tourist ski region, is also home to a community of permanent people there and also home to a number of species that only exist in that, in that region. So we're facing really massive um, kind of change about to happen in the ecology there. And so from Jan February next year, I'll be working there. So they've, they've decided that one of their ways they're going to um, explore this issue is to work with artists in the region. So I'll be going there to work for the entire year um, with the community, the permanent community that live in that location to understand how do we even start to, to get our head, head around such, such a piece of information. How do we be there as people and understand this is within a little as three to ten years that this is going to be happening. It's going to affect our livelihood, but it's also going to affect the ecology around us and the animals and the things that we love about this place. Um, so in terms of that sort of broader work and just the little bits of our work that I've shared with you tonight is how we understand this, how we draw this back to the butterfly kiss and the story of Val Plumwood. And so I'm going to stop there. <laughs> to put me in, into a state of good old-fashioned nostalgia. <laughs> um, thank you so much. The butterfly kiss, art as the butterfly kiss. Amazing. And the idea of that, that crucial insight that um, before you start dealing with these difficult situations in a kind of practical way, um, that part of that is gaining kind of emotional understanding um, and, and finding a way of communicating that. Um, and mixed and conflicted emotions. So how important is this work around uh, emotion and, uh, and environmental change? I'm opening it up for questions, comments. Yes. Um, thank you for both of those talks. Um, they were, for me, so rich and, uh, yeah, they speak to a lot of things that I'm thinking about. Um, but I, we've actually just come back from Western Australia. We went to a conference at Caratha, and uh, I've been sort of. It got me really thinking about. Um, if, oh, I, I'm not like diminishing the fact that the Anthropocene and the rapidity of change is really, really significant, and how we respond to it is really challenging. But uh, human beings, human cultures have have been in circumstances of massive change that's also happened quite fast in the past. I think it's really interesting to think about how people have responded and in fact, um, well, let me tell you about one of the experiences that we had, which was we went to visit quite a lot of rock art in um, what's now the Burrup Peninsula, it's also called Murujuga. Mm. And, um, in, that, uh, in the peninsula, basically about 10,000 years ago with the Holocene, there was very, very rapid sea level rise and uh, it basically inundated a vast landscape and turned it into an archipelago of islands. And the rock art that people have made there records this change. It's the most extraordinary thing. So your projections mm -hmm. and your taking these images back to places that are linked with their with the causing the changes, I just found very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. So in those contexts, there are literally the, um, the, some of these rock art panels record the uh, marine animals like turtles and stingrays and fish and dugongs over the top of uh, images of terrestrial am animals, so kangaroos, emus, and there's even a thylacine which is now, of course, has been extinct for many tens of thousands of years in the area. So I just, that really, I found very, very powerful in terms of, as a kind of um, way of thinking through what we're experiencing now at a different scale and a different type of intensity, but it's not like, as a, as a species, it's not like we've never been here before. So maybe there are some things we can look back to. I've also been to uh, the, that area and, and looked at the, the amazing you know, tens of thousands of pieces of art, both on the mainland and offshore. And it, it is an incredible thing that uh, they've built a petrochemical industry adjacent to the rock art, 
with uh, an explosives mm -hmm. uh, factory as well, feeding off some of the sulphur and other byproducts of the um, of the gas industry, which is located there. And so, yes, as a as a moment of emotional impact, you just you're allowed to walk over the rocks where you, you, you know you've got a 40,000 year uh, petroglyph uh, right under you, and you see this explosives factory spewing out stuff which is toxic and, and acidic, uh, and it's already beginning to have a, an erosive effect on the art. So, you know, I've argued that the borough should be de-industrialised. You can imagine how popular I am. <laughs> but, the, the other issue, I, I, it's not a criticism of the point you made, because I think at various places around Australia the sea level rise was rapid, but it, in eastern Australia, for example, the uh, 120 metres of uh, sea level rise took place over about 8,000 years. So people had time to adjust to that, and presumably way offshore there are places uh, of great archaeological significance and historical significance but it's not the case that all of Australia experienced this rapid um, uh, um, change in the, uh, in the sea level. So it's an interesting issue that the culture retains the memory of those changes, whether they were rapid or slow. And so when you talk to people, uh, Indigenous people all over Australia, they, they have stories of, in, a, in effect, the, the amazing impact that that change in sea level had on their culture at that time. And so the story is 8,000 years old, even before you get to the present, you know, so it's quite, quite a piece of history, really. But yeah, if you would get the chance to go to Mutujuba, do it, because uh, I don't think, uh, unless the World Heritage application is successful, um, I can't see the petrochemical industry actually slowing down much. Um, yeah, thanks. It's, it's very exciting to hear all these new terms, and I think you know we definitely do need new languages, concepts, and things. Um, but things like eco paralysis, um, the idea that people are sort of paralysed because the you know too many decisions. But I would say that it's more like people are being entrapped, and um, that capitalism modernity spends a huge amount of energy in making sure people can't make decisions and people can't change what they're doing. And a lot of these terms do seem to be about the individual confronting a situation or communities confronting a situation. But we need to learn terms for what the systems are doing to, to, to counter, you know, who's using these words. We've had lots of cool language for environmental crisis since at least, you know, Rachel Carson, Leopold, and that sort of stuff. But they don't penetrate into mainstream politics, mainstream economic thinking, because that is very vigorously defended. I would agree that they go in, uh, but they're absorbed and like sustainability, for example, um, uh, is now part of corporate speak for let's keep doing what we've always done. So that's what to sustain means. So I, I think we've just not had the right uh, conceptual apparatus to understand the nature of the problem and the ones that we've used so far have been easily corrupted by those that want to um, simply use them in a way that furthers their, their interests. So the, the critique of the web of life, sustainability, resilience, uh, all of those things I think uh, needs to take place at all levels, you know, um, political economy and also uh, you know, at the micro psychological, psychotheoretic level. But I 100% agree with you that we've, we've failed with the lexicon, the language, up to now. And that's one of the reasons why I've decided not to be a professor of sustainability. I'm a professor of some biology, a new discipline that nobody's ever heard of. But it will be impossible to correct. <laughs> I mean, the problem is, isn't it, uh, who determines the terms of the debate sure. that, that we are engaging in? So, uh, in these islands, uh, you know, we are facing sea level rise. Uh, and already there is managed retreat on the east coast uh, of England where the boulder clay cliffs are eroding as a result of uh, big storms much more quickly than they were in the past and so on. Mm. Uh, 
but um, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about your positive and negatives because it seems to me that some of those positives actually can be negative. So the respect and the admiration, the beauty of local place uh, puts up a resistance uh, to alternative forms of energy, for example, so wind farms, so solar so, uh, energy farms, so uh, tidal barrages, all have their oppositions mm. arising out of uh, local people's admiration and affection for place and their failure to actually link the long term with the short term and the present aesthetics with what will be the future effect, uh, aesthetics of sea level rise if we don't actually act uh, in, in the Anthropocene. So it's, it's, it's how these uh, notions get balanced and how the complexities get talked out in actually making policies and the policy choices available to us that I think is the, the, the problem. And I'd, I'd like to see how uh, symbiosis actually can be turned into positive energies for people who have a very strong attachment to place and don't want to see it being changed uh, under the demands that are necessary in confronting the seriousness of the Anthropocene if they get the, the level of seriousness through to them. I don't know what you'd say about that. Well, I've already said a bit. Do, do you have a response? To I think you're the only one who says something. All right. Well, I've helped uh, people fight wind farms on uh, ridgetops in eastern Australia. And I'm a great fan of alternative energy. But I think the, uh, the technologies of massive wind turbines on uh, landscapes which people love is just, a serious, just as serious as looking at 500 square kilometres of open pit coal mining. I take both as serious cases of uh, an imposed and unwelcome change in a landscape that people highly value. So I don't think we should demean the fact that people love their landscapes. Often the wind turbines, the wind farms come in under uh, fear, so there's no discussion with the locals, it's, it's that sort of decisions are made at a uh, large scale. Uh, and although I'm a great fan of uh, wind generated energy because it's free, renewable, uh, it's manufactured in a way that is highly polluting and is uh, constructed using the biggest cranes of the Anthropocene. So the Symbiocene is going to have to have energy that's uh, way different than wind turbines and you know, a zillion acres of uh, silicon and lithium based batteries and, and solar panels. Uh, they are transitioned to something that will actually have to be a lot better and will uh, integrate with landscapes, will be biologically uh, produced as well as uh, um, biologically compatible with human life and, and the biota that uh, people live with in, in bioregions. Uh, so I, I argue that free, clean, renewable and safe is great, but we haven't quite made it yet on you know, the ideal form of energy for, for humans on Earth. Uh, it has to be connected to the sun, obviously, but uh, plant-based. And uh, they now make uh, uh, solar cells out of uh, uh, plant, plant cell material. You can probably eat them if you don't really feel like generating solar electricity with them. So they're, they're that biodegradable. So I, 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 I acknowledge your point. Um, people can be very reactionary, but often for really good reasons. And uh, historically, uh, the defense of place, I think, is part of being human. If people are, are attached to place, have developed culture in place, develop language in place, develop a biological knowledge base over thousands of years, if not in Australia, tens of thousands of years, uh, I don't see that as atavism or any kind of um, you know, leading towards Nazi Germany love of nature stuff that we all suddenly recoil from because it, it's being used and, and misused. So I, I would defend all that, despite being uh, a greenie, and I would argue that it's all a transition to something 
that humans don't really conceptualise clearly as yet. But it's a bit like uh, Jonathan Lear's radical hope. Um, you know, there is part of this culture that's going to have to be transported into the future, but the future is going to have to look a bit different to what we currently conceptualise. And that includes wind turbines on the top of ridgetops. In our region, there's a number of large-scale solar farms being developed in the sort of wider region, which is always sort of a very positive thing. But what I'm starting to notice is that um, these these new solar industries that are being set up actually have these terrible working conditions for their staff, who are unsupported, who have to work extremely long hours, 16-hour days. I think one of them has something like a 16-hour day lost, 16-day lost upon. Um, so you know, what I'm noticing is these places actually don't have you know, they're driven by business-driven ideologies rather than processes of care that I would hope would be behind these systems. So it's something that's just sort of happening in our region it's, um, that shows to me something, something underlying, an underlying philosophy that's actually not there as part of, of these new great um, power-generating systems. See, there are negative cons consequences of, of all actions, uh, including alternative forms of alternative energy. Uh, and you seem to be suggesting that these compromises can be made without our giving up anything, without actually our compromising us, our sense of place as it presently is undertaken. I mean, these places around the coast are going to be underwater. They're not even going to exist. Mm -hmm. So their aesthetics are going to be zero. <laughs> um, and, and I'm interested in the kind of d really difficult, hard choices that are being faced um, by, uh, within the concept of affect and adjusting affect to the new conditions, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Well, I think you know, the, the concept that these places aren't going to exist because they're going to be underwater is terrifying and hard to address. Uh, but the only way I can start to address it that is to go to somewhere like Falls Creek where I can do it in a stage of, of understanding what this impending change that we know is going to happen within a short period of time, three yeah. to ten years. Yeah. It's going to have change the lifestyle of every single person there to see what is that experience of being in that community to try to understand it. And I have no greater insight than that. I have no greater insight than what's going to be discovered during that process with the hope that that can contribute something to this sort of question. Mm. The hope that we can discover something that might be of relevance outside of that outline region um, to myself, to you, to other people. Mm. Um, because surely there's going to be something we can draw on from the experience people are having at that place. And I, I, I've declared World War III, which is the war of the emotions. So we, we now have to confront a highly destructive Anthropocene with its opposite, uh, a Symbiocene that's, uh, you know, I've given Generation S, Gen S, the task of uh, bringing this uh, revolution about. But every single toxic, non-recyclable artefact of the Anthropocene has to be replaced with a Sylvia effect, which is recyclable, edible, produced by fungi, uh, whatever. Um, and because there are 7.5 billion of us uh, heading towards a page, we no longer have a choice uh, in how we make things on this planet any longer as humans. Either it's going to be compatible to the rest of life or it isn't. So managed retreat, that's not an affect, that's, that's uh, uh, cold, hard fact if we don't do anything about uh, addressing the, uh, the prospect of an 80 metre sea level rise, which is what we get when Antarctica, the Arctic and Greenland all, all melt. Well, you know, I'm buying real estate uh, on the higher section of Antarctica now. It's, it's, rock, it's rock. It's going to be a beautiful climate because, you know, a few million years ago it was quite nice. And uh, at the moment, there's not a lot of competition for it. That's what, that's what happens if you let the Anthropocene just keep mm. unfolding. Mm. Mm. Meanwhile, of course, the revolution is happening on the right. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here, probably like other people, just you know, reeling from um, what's happening in, in Brazil. And I think that's something that we really, really need to try and understand as well. Um, you know, the, the rise of this kind of um, you know, far right in the face of 
The Green Party just emailed saying that the budget today, the Chancellor has not mentioned climate change. It's not just Brazil and then, you know, mm -hmm. even a relatively benign, relatively benign democratic mm -hmm. political mm -hmm. systems of places like the UK are not making hard choices because they're not even acknowledging all this stuff needs to happen. Yeah. Ian and then Mike. Yeah. Thank you very much, both of you. Very, very interesting. And I, I'm there's a connection that I've been trying to find between where you're both coming from. And it, it, I think it has to do with what George Lakoff says about language and the importance of metaphor. And the fact that you are effectively catalyzing nonviolent conversations. Um, and in that sense, reducing the kind of level of, of tension uh, and allowing people to find their own language and their own metaphor to talk about what most immediately affects them. And because I see a lot of connections between what you're doing and, for example, somebody I know, a man called Simon Reed who is an artist working to maintain uh, coastal, natural coastal defences to prevent precisely this kind of rapid erosion. It seems to me that we move too quickly um, with the result that we, to, to use an Australian expression, piss people off uh, by patronising them about their needs, their places, their responsibilities, rather than giving them what it, I see you doing, which is giving them this opportunity through the art as a kind of catalyst to really have the opportunity to talk about these issues. And we seem to be, understandably, due, given the pressures, in such a hurry to come to solutions that we're not allowing these conversations to take place. And I hear echoes of what the Americans call liberation psychologies in what you're doing. What interests me in a very practical way is what do, how do you, and please don't get me wrong, how do you move from the art to sharing what the art is catalyzing? Because that seems to me absolutely crucial in what you're doing. I think um, there's many things I'll say. So I think one of the main things that these projects are doing it is about giving those people a voice, mm. and whether that's different voices, which may be you know, often it often is, and that is so that those voices can be heard by everyone else in the community, but also so those voices can be heard by those people speaking them, because maybe they haven't even heard that voice inside mm. themselves yet, and so it's an opportunity for that discovery to happen. I think a part of um, the success, and I say the word success just in terms of the fact that we, the CAT Factory can now continually get these opportunities in terms of financially and resource-wise to actually go and do some of these projects, is because of that line we've been able to draw between a, a project that's about access and participation for a community and about projects that are about art making. So, you know, as was mentioned, we've had projects that have been at the Tate in Liverpool, at some of our major art institutions in Australia, and have been um, held up with regard in terms of that. But also the making of them has been so profound and so um, deep. And I, I, in the last year, I've had, had a big sort of change where, because a lot of these outcomes are deep within the community, yeah. they happen out there, and so documentation becomes an important part of that in order to be able to share. Um, but I've also found speaking about projects. So I've, I've been coming to England for the last four years to work in a children's hospital on a project about noise levels in hospitals and how they're causing um, increases in hospital stay and increases in medication and stuff patients. So how can I sort of medical research and have some effect on it? Um, and so that project, which was, again, one of the most profound things I've ever experienced in, I've ever experienced, it was fabulous sharing some of that at the table Liverpool, great institution, great opportunity to do that. But what I've been finding is, you know, I'm continually being asked to speak at, um, going to speak to medical students, for example, and speak at medical conferences and art. 
place. So then what I'm finding is it's that speaking about it, sharing in front of, you know, sometimes recently I spoke with patient experience in Malaysia, which was 600 people, including our health minister. So the health minister was there having to listen to me as an artist while he's on this. And that change that can happen. So, you know, when I was the keynote speaker at the patient experience, it was in my head very um, high up in the hierarchy, medical hierarchy. Doctor came up to me afterwards saying, when I read in a program that the keynote speaker was an artist, I thought, holy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but what you said was yes. profound. And yeah. I just want to say thank you. Yeah. So that sort of shift has been happening. So in terms of that, now I've been offered opportunities to, I've actually just been offered to actually go in as part of multidisciplinary medical teams to position an artist there as a giver of care within yeah. hospitals. So not as arts therapy, music therapy, yeah. that sort of thing, but as a temporary artist being there with multidisciplinary yeah. medical professionals to say we have something to offer. And so, you know, I'm learning, especially in the last couple of years where I used to think we'll do these projects, but then we'll also share them in galleries to share them to a wider audience. I might do that sometimes, but there's something much more profound of that for me about in terms of that stuff, I know and then to take this into medicine and, um, and, ha and affect a change there. So, and then when you know, the Falls Creek stuff happens, you know, I'm not sure where that will go, but it'll be something, a story that comes from that will, that will then have to be taken by, the taking will be led by me into, into some area, whether we can, some government's just a couple of hundred kilometers away. You know, wherever we have to take that as evidence of something that exists. So, you know, my real interest is in how then I can take that outside of the art world yeah. into whatever sector that governs yeah. that, that area. Yeah. No, I think that's a fantastic aim to have. Um, and it's not always something that the art world is desperately appreciative of. So, more strength to your elbow. <laughs> you know, well that, you know, the work we had at the I had an amazing experience where it was just a week before they sent me an email back, I was back in Australia asking if I wanted to share the work there where I met with a gallery in Australia. It was my third meeting about sharing that same work at this yeah. gallery. And during that third meeting, they weirdly all of a sudden said, hang on, this is community work. Why do you want to show this? And I said, what do you mean? We've been, this is our third point. You know what the work yeah. is. Like, it's really profound installation work. It's contemporary art. Um, and so they said they didn't want to show it. And then, you know, just a few days later, there was an email from the Tate. <laughs> and so then when I was over here showing the Tate, I got an email from that gallery in Australia yeah. saying, Oh, he read the tape. Can you miss the phone? Can you one of those conversations? Yeah, so well, I mean, I think you're doing really well. Simon, the man I was referring to, was at a big opening in London, and he was introduced to a major critic and uh, by a friend. And the critic says, oh, what do you do? And Simon says, well, I'm involved in ecological art. And the guy just looked at him and said, how worthy, turned around and walked away. <laughs> so you're doing better than that. Exactly. <laughs> um, and I'm going to add just a tiny bit about the, the practical outcome of, say, my work as a philosopher, transdisciplinary thinker. I've worked pro bono for community groups, um, one in particular, the Bolga Milvodal Progress Association, who have been... Uh, uh, confronted by an expansion of a huge mine in Hunter Valley, um, which was being uh, supported by the state government. So we went to the Land and Environment Court of New South Wales and uh, defended Solastalgia as a, uh, a loss of sense of place, and we won. And, uh, it, it's a, and the point is that the people of the valley uh, all individually felt a sense of, uh, of, of grief and loss with respect to the mining that had already taken place, but they didn't have a concept with which they could share their collective knowledge of what was going on. That was if it was as if each one had their own private grief. So then, when you give them something that they can share, not only did they share it as a cultural um, tool of communication, but uh, also um, could use it in a legal and political way as well. Um, I have to tell you the end of the story, which is that because we won in the Land and Environment Court on social, economic and environmental grounds, uh, and in subsequent appeal in the New South Wales Supreme Court, the State Government of New South Wales changed the law so that the mine could proceed uh, on a different legal basis and the mm -hmm. consenting authorities had no obligation, uh, you know, had uh, uh, no choice but to, uh, to approve the mine. So we lost, but 
that was a, you know, for a government to do that after the proper uh, legal procedures had been uh, put through was an act of bastardry. So and everyone knows that that's what happened. So although Solastalgia may have started as a short little essay in Pan, it ended up in the Land and Environment Court and actually was part of a successful case against people who were about to destroy yet another village in the Hunter Valley. So there is a practical end to some of the work that I do in the same way that uh, I think Vic was explaining that uh, you give something back to, co to communities and then they can use it. Um, and uh, I, I never expected to end up in the Land and Environment Court being a, an expert witness for a community group fighting a coal mine. Uh, mm -hmm. But there you go. That's the kind of path that these uh, changes to our conceptual landscape can, can bring about. Uh, yeah, um, thanks very much for both of you. Brilliant. Um, I, I, my question is for, for Gen, really. Um, I, uh, I remember the original paper and, uh, and, I, and I found it very useful and it's a drawn on it for various places. But I, I'm kind of in, in reflexively or whatever. My, my first instinct is to be suspicious of neologisms, you know. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but that it's clearly seems to be one that there wasn't a word for that, and, mm. and it's well, you just illustrated with that anecdote how beautifully how it really was a concept that needed to be named and, yeah. and, and brought into um, uh, brought into use, and uh, uh, yeah, and I, uh, sort of it was very thought provoking to hear it now, sort of set in, in context of a whole suite of such terms, you know, and uh, uh, probably. Some will get taken up and some less so. And, that's, whatever. That's the way, and, that's and I'm the way loving the Simia scene. I'm thinking, why have I never even heard that before? That's great. <coughs> uh, I'm looking forward to hearing a lot more. But um, you're, now that you've heard it, you're in it. So yeah, I'm in it. You can't get it's out of it. Um, you're, you're trapped. And I wanted to ask you about a, uh, a, a related neologism that, that I have from a few years ago, uh, which is oikophilia from uh, uh, Roger Scrooge. Mm. coined it, uh, and uh, I thought, that's a beautiful word, and, and, a, and actually a beautiful concept, a sort of love of home, and, uh, and then, but then of course he does horrible things with it, uh, you know, and it is the revolution of the right, and the kind of like, it goes back to what Terry was talking about, he's like, oh, the love of home, and, it, and, it, he, and he, because he, 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 you know, I mean, you know, profoundly disagree with an awful lot of things he says, but he's a, he's a very eloquent persuasive writer and he sort of elides this kind of love of the home environment with uh, seamlessly but by the end of the chapter it, it's nationalism you know yeah well uh, I wonder if you, if you thought well, about well oikos that. management of the household root word for ecology and economics you know that there's something going to go wrong there so, you know it's, it, there's no way that this is going to be compatible for you know a long period of time so I mean just think about uh, ecology and ecosystem uh, so begin to subject that to a, a, a symbiocentric thinking. All of a sudden, the boundaries that define ecosystems fall apart. They're just abstractions that people who want systems theory and management, the same management that's in eco uh, e um, economics as management of the household, is applicable. What do you get next? You get uh, you know, people wanting uh, to put dollar values on ecosystem services. You want people putting uh, dollar values on rare and endangered species. So it, it, it's no wonder that Scruton loves the oikos because it's perfect uh, uh, material for neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, ecologists have mm -hmm. fallen for that hook, line and sinker. So that's why I'm getting rid of ecology, the environment, sustainability, resilience, uh, and quite a few other, um, you know, well-worn and now worn out concepts, because they're bloody useless, and they're actually part of the problem. <laughs> so yeah, uh, you don't have to buy it, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure I've invented quite a few concepts, about 50 something at the moment. Uh, some are dismal failures already, and I know that they're just not gonna fly. But so others, like uh, solophilia, um, the collaboration between people needed to protect places that they value and love. Uh, that's now doing well. Uti area was nothing a few years ago and there's 
tens of thousands of hit, hits now. But that's one that's been appropriated that people want that word to be associated with bath soaps and, and body <laughs> removal systems and yoga. You know, so you can't control these things once they get out there. Uh, but I try with the definitions to keep them fairly coherent. But I'm such a bad business person, I don't even, uh, I don't have any domain names, you know, I don't even have hashtags, you know, it's a, I'm a fossil from a different era. <laughs> I think we might just take one more question and then we can continue talking over a drink. Um, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm just fascinated by these terms because, you know, not being from this this world, um, all these terms that I've been hit with, to me, they, they, I'm an artist and a painter, and I like, you know, some of them, they are beautiful, I, I can imagine using those in paintings or, you know, works of art and so on, but you just said there, you just mentioned yourself, that, that they have a certain lifespan, and... No, they were the bad ones. They're, they're, the bad ones, ones right. they're, they're, they're over now. Yeah. You can even go on yeah. Now. But the new ones you've invented, how long are they going to last for? Or oh, I've seen the symbiosis in this uh, an indefinite period of time of great joy and happiness. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to put a date on that. Uh, I'm just impatient for the rest of the world to join it. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they, they do eventually become sort of useless and meaningless. Well, <laughs> They all will in the sense that the bad ones will disappear. Um, the good ones won't be necessary because we won't, we'll be living in a way that is uh, similar to uh, what you might call the proto symbiocene or the first symbiocene. Of course, life wasn't all sweetness and joy and you know, nasty things happen, but uh, by and large, uh, life is good and it seems to be a hell of a lot better than death. Uh, so, as a result, uh, in just supporting life as a project with humans within it, uh, supporting each other as uh, life forms, uh, it seems to me that the party could go on for you know, another, what is it, when, when the sun goes, it's about 3.5 billion years, so that seems like a pretty long party yeah. to me. That's, uh, I'm looking forward to it being long lived. And also, we won't need nostalgia. I mean, that'll go from the Eid Dictionary about the year 2100 because there'll be no nostalgic moments that we need. So, a bit like Robert, Rob McFarlane, you know, lamenting the loss of Bluebell, as I turn in my grave, composting away, I won't lament the loss of nostalgia. It'll be a source of great joy. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should start our little party now. But I uh, just ask you to join with me. Thank you. Yeah. and do please stay and uh